Good morning, everyone. Um, I am Miriam Krinsky. I'm the executive director of Fair and Just Prosecution. And it's truly my pleasure to have so many of you joining us from all over the country. I um, believe that we have um, well over 100 people and counting um, joining us for this conversation today. And we are so pleased, along with our partners at FAM, uh, to be having a chance to discuss an issue that is both incredibly important um, and incredibly timely. And frankly, I think this is an issue that is long overdue in terms of the focus that is rightly getting around the nation. We know that as we sit here today, our country is the highest incarcerator in the world. We have the highest incarceration rate and the harshest sentencing starting points. While we represent only 4% of the world's population, we represent a, um, a frankly um, harmful and, um, and shameful 20% of the world's incarcerated population. Today, we have more people in our nation serving life sentences than the entire incarcerated population in this country in 1970. Half of them are individuals um, of color, over a third of them are over the age of 55. That's simply not acceptable. And as we know from a host of recent reports and studies, including an excellent report that went out today from the Sentencing Project, as well as a recent Brennan Center study, that second study found that 39% of incarcerated individuals could be released safely. That amounts to 860,000 people behind bars who really don't need to be there to promote and protect public safety. The vast majority of people we also know who commit crimes, even very serious ones, grow out of that behavior. They age out of the risk that they may have posed at one moment in time. They should not forever be defined by their worst moment, their biggest mistake. So this status quo that we continue to maintain in our nation is expensive, it is at odds with public safety, and it takes not simply great fiscal toll into the billions of dollars that could so much better be spent in our country, but it also comes at a tremendously great human toll for those individuals who could safely return home, for their families, for their loved ones, for their entire community. In this moment, these issues are particularly dire. As the COVID pandemic has raged across our nations, our prisons and jails were among our nation's largest hotspots. Social distancing simply isn't possible behind bars, and those individuals behind bars, especially individuals who are in their 50s, 60s, and older, are particularly vulnerable to the circumstances that they find themselves in. And what spreads through our prisons and jails also is brought back to our communities and puts at risk the individuals who work in those facilities as well as their family and loved ones. This is also a moment where rightfully so, we have a long overdue national reckoning with racial disparities. And those disparities are particularly prevalent in our nation as over the decades we were ramping up mass incarceration. We know that sentencing review can and would correct and address these issues. And we also know that communities in larger and increasing numbers support change. They're demanding a new starting point. We know that polling tells us that there is bipartisan support for sentencing review. Over 69% of voters support second look legislation that allows a reexamination of sentencing for people who have been in prison for more than, two, more than 10 years in those instances where they can safely return to the community. And we know that that support for bipartisan reform is one that is pervasive. That bipartisan support tells us that 81% of Democrats support change and 64% of Republicans support change. So if ever there are a moment to have this conversation, that moment is now. We can change this starting point. And we have with us today four incredible experts and passionate leaders to discuss these issues. First, Tyrone Walker, who's an associate at the Justice Policy Initiative, where he uses his experience, his expertise, and his passion for prison rep reform to advocate for change. He will be joining the Georgetown University Prisons 
and Justice Initiative as their Director of Reentry Services. And Tyrone, they'll be very lucky to have you there. Kevin Ring is the president of our great partner at FAM, which seeks to create a more fair and effective justice system. We've seen their great work that respects our American values of individual accountability and dignity while keeping communities safe. And Kevin, it's always great to partner with you and your colleagues. Jazz Lewis represents Maryland's 24th legislative district in the Maryland House of Delegates, where he has been a leader and a champion for a range of criminal justice reforms. Those reforms include the recently passed Juvenile Restoration Act that we'll have a chance to talk to Del with Delegate Lewis about. And Delegate Lewis, we wish you could, we could clone you and put you in every legislative body around our nation. And finally, last but not least, is DA Mike Sch Schmidt from Multnomah County, Oregon, which includes the great city of Portland. Mike has been doing so many things to change paradigms in his jurisdiction, including supporting legislative change in Oregon that would give prosecutors the ability to review and correct sentences that no longer serve the interest of justice. So Kevin, as we launch into the conversation, I wanna start with you and have you perhaps define a little bit of the conversation we're about to have. Tell us what we mean when we talk about second look reform or second chances and the work of FAM in that arena. Uh, I will, and thanks for having me, Miriam. Thanks, it's great to partner with you and FJP and with all the other panelists. Um, I think what we've seen over the years is that we have a lot of ways of throwing people away in this country for long periods of time and not a lot of ways of revisiting those lengthy sentences. We have lengthy mandatory minimum sentences. We have sentencing enhancements. People aware of the trial penalty where they are punished not because of what they did, but because of the exercise, their right to go to trial. And then when we throw these people away, we have very few ways to revisit those sentences. Uh, parole is gone at the federal level and in many states where it exists, it's not used as robustly as it should. Uh, clemency, governors are more reluctant to use it, it seems, in recent years than they had in the past. And then even back-end mechanisms like compassionate release and medical parole are not used as they should be for the population, even when it was targeted by a disease like COVID, which specifically targeted uh, you know, senior citizens and elderly people in prison. And so we realize that we are not up to the task with our current uh, sort of reform agenda. And groups like FAM that have been fighting for eliminating mandatory sentences and others realize that our prisons are not filled with just low level nonviolent drug offenders. We have all sorts of people in our prison. And if we're gonna really reduce over-incarceration, we're gonna have to take aim at that population. And what we've also seen over the years is some natural experiments play out. So there was a lot of research that said that long prison uh, sentences didn't deter people, and that even its incapacitation effect was not as great as we thought. But then, like I said, we saw some natural experiments play out. So when we had the Supreme Court decisions of Miller and Montgomery, and we saw juvenile lifers have to be resentenced, like in the state of Philadelphia, I mean, state of Pennsylvania. In Philadelphia alone, there were 269 juvenile lifers who were resentenced. 174 were released. Of those two, have recommitted new offenses. That's 1%. Now, these are people who we were prepared to let die in prison. We were not going to give them a second chance. And when we actually made the change, it was a Supreme Court decision that did it, to release them, we saw the level of recidivism was, slow, was so low. So we know, we've seen this time and time again with the Ungers in Maryland and other things that have been done, that we don't need to use these long sentences. So FAM started a second chances agenda that basically said, we need to create as many mechanisms for as many system actors to revisit these sentences. And you talked about some of them. Second look laws, which allow judges to revisit sentences after a certain period of time, maybe 10 or 15 years. We need further clemency. We need governors to use their clemency authority to get people out of these long sentences where injustice has been the result. Um, we need compassionate release and back end mechanisms so that people who are elderly or infirm don't need to die in prison when they are the least likely to reoffend, re but the most expensive to incarcerate. That makes no sense, we're wasting money. 
and prosecutors with your leadership are starting to use sentence review units so they can revisit these long sentences. So we're trying to create all these mechanisms and build support for these mechanisms to revisit these long sentences, which are not making us safer. And I think the sentencing projects report work that you've done and others has clearly established that long sentences are not keeping us safer. In fact, we're wasting money keeping people in prison and that money could be better spent in communities and doing other things that do make us safe. Thanks so much, um, Kevin, for that great landscaping of the issue. And, and I would note um, to reinforce what Kevin said that, that a Bureau of Justice statistics report also found that recidivism, recidivism rates are lowest among those convicted of the most serious violent crimes. So I think that really debunks the notion that those who are in custody, even for uh, what we sometimes label or overlabel violent crimes, um, can safely return to the community. And we spend a lot of money and waste a lot of lives by failing to do so. And so Delegate Lewis, you um, have actually put, um, put these concepts into action by moving forward with a recently passed bill that you sponsored. Tell us about that legislation, why it was important and why you thought it made sense for communities and also for addressing those very serious concerns around racial disparities. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Miriam. And I, I wanna thank you and uh, you know, Fair and Just Policy uh, Prosecution for having me on, Kevin and Pam, um, uh, DA Mike Schwett. Hopefully I say this correctly, it's Multnomah County. Uh, hopefully I didn't brutalize that. <laughs> uh, and of course, uh, Tyrone, the Justice Policy Institute. I'm happy to be here uh, with you all. Uh, I championed a bill this past legislative session called the Juvenile Restoration Act, which was focused on giving, essentially people who were given lengthy sentences for some rather extreme things, um, the opportunity for sentencing review after they've served uh, 20 years. Uh, it you know, entitles them to a hearing, not to being released, is to make sure that they get their day in court. Uh, and it's not political, you're not going before, let's say a parole board that the governor can say yes or no to. And um, I'm not gonna repeat the data that, that Kevin just stated, uh, but the proof is in the pudding. You know, you can have your own opinion, uh, but the facts are that uh, many of these people who we give very long uh, sentences to uh, don't necessarily need it from a standpoint of, of safety to the, to the public if they were to be released. And 25 states and jurisdictions have Pass uh, bills similar to mine. Um, you know, some are going even further. I know that I believe DC and Tyrone was part of that. Uh, uh, is pushing it uh, to 15 years, uh, which I think is a is a good thing. Um, I believe that uh, second look should be focused on uh, being smart on rehabilitation. You know, you give permanent sentences to people who aren't able to change, and overwhelmingly, these people who commit a lot of these. Uh, sentences that get them a lot amount of time is disproportionately young people, uh, not exclusively, but but largely young people. And they, as was stated by Miriam, uh, many of them age out of crime, literally age out of crime based on the data. Uh, so it's unnecessary to keep them forever. And um, uh, the evidence shows that. In Maryland, we had a, uh, a case called Unger versus Maryland, where 198 people who had been given life sentences uh, for serious crimes were released after the court found that the jury instructions they gave were given to them were essentially uh, unconstitutional. And in the five and a half years uh, since they've been released, only five of the 198 people have recidivated for parole violations or, or, or petty crime, um, showing us many things. First of, uh, of, of all, is that there's a way to safely release people who have committed serious and even violent offenses uh, instead of incarcerating them for life. Uh, we can support public safety while rethinking our response to violent offenses. Um, Reentry services are critically important. In the Unger case, we, we uh, through uh, social workers and um, housing and options towards these folks to make sure that they wouldn't fall through the cracks. And lo and behold, when we gave them a chance, they stepped up to the plate. Uh, and I think that's uh, critically important. Incarcerating the geriatric population uh, is completely unnecessary. And you know, um, we're getting some bipartisan support on that because it's expensive. You know, you are incarcerating people who could be released to the public, but since they are in the care of the state, you know, you have to pay for their care. Too often, it's not adequate care, uh, which is another thing that I think we all across the country are working on. Uh, but that's that's important. Um, 
And, and ultimately in, in the Unger case, over 90% of the people who were sentenced were black. And um, uh, there's, there's a huge discrepancy in who get these cases. In Maryland, for example, 82% uh, of children sentenced to die in prison are black. Uh, when you look at life equivalent sentences exclusively, it, it gets up to 87%. Um, which is higher than any other state in the nation, uh, higher than Louisiana, Mississippi, or Alabama, or whichever you want to think. Uh, so the fact of the matter is that these sentences are essentially reserved almost exclusively for, for Black children or minority children. And that's just wrong, you know? Um, that, uh, that's just completely wrong. So to correct these past injustices, we need to revisit these sentences. And um, one thing we often forget in this conversation is the opportunity cost of not having these folks re-enter the communities to which they've left. And oftentimes people who have been incarcerated for, for whatever it is that they did can be the best messengers to communities um, on, you know, on what they need to do to not go down their path. And uh, that, that's been, as I've gone down this road of working on this legislation and I've worked with juvenile lifers who've come home and I've seen them talk to youth and reach them in a way that I could never reach them. Uh, I think that's important. I also think we need to remember that, you know, um, this issue is bipartisan. You know, in my bill, you know, I'm a young black man uh, who's in the House of Delegates. Uh, the Senate sponsor was an older Republican conservative white gentleman, right? I came more from a humanitarian side. He came from a fiscal conservatism side. Either way, uh, we're giving life and hope to people who deserve it. And I think uh, that is critically important. So I thank you guys for having me on here. And um, I'm looking forward to any questions folks may have. Thanks so much, Delegate Lewis, and um, I appreciate the robust conversation um, that we're seeing with messages folks are sending us, um, and we absolutely do plan to talk about issues around how we bring um, and get survivors on board. Um, we, I know we've talked quite a bit about life sentences, but all of these factors and all of the suggested reforms apply whether one is talking about the, that most extreme sentence or decades long sentences that have very much contributed to the overfilling of our, our nation's prisons and jails. And Tyrone, you've seen these issues and I wanna turn um, the mic over to you. You've seen them professionally in the work that you've done, you've seen them personally. So talk to us about your insights on these issues. Well, thank you, Mario, for having me and being amongst these distinguished panelists and everyone who's here, thank you for being here. That's a really tough question because it, 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 it generally brings about raw emotions from my experience as being a young black man going into the prison system at a very young age and being raised by a surrogate mother of the prison system and having such a long prison sentence at a very young age is, is like you can't really comprehend it. I didn't really understand it. You know, I was, I was 20 when I got sentenced. I was 19 when they arrested me. And even then, I didn't even realize how much time I had. You know, it was my mentor who told me I had 127 years of life. I didn't really understand it. And I, I, I still never processed that. And he was like, do you understand what I'm telling you? I was like, no. So that, is, so that is very tough at a very young age to have such a, a long prison sentence and then coming to the realization that you might die there. So I went through that process for a while and then I just started to mature. I was like, I started to grow up here. And I was like 26, they still had the Pell Grants. I was in college. And I woke up one day, the light bulb just was on, it was bright. I knew what I wanted to do. I was embarrassed for a while because all of my older peers knew what they wanted to do with their lives. I was so confused, but I couldn't explain to them why I was confused and why I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. Then the light bulb came off like 26 years old. I was, I'll never forget, I was going to Allegheny College and like the light bulb came on and I was like, oh, I know exactly what I wanted to do. I knew all the books I wanted to read. I knew everything about me that I didn't know before. And that made me happy. And there's so many people who change 
And it's no way possible that the sentencing judge at that time can know what type of person you're going to become. And when given the chance, people who are going to come home from incarceration and go back to these communities that don't even know them, don't even know that the men and women that they have become today. And as Delegate Lewis said, going to be the ages of change in the communities who have essentially written them off because I'm one of them. They didn't see me grow up in my community because I was too young. I, I, I went into the prison system. And so I come home this way. They're like, wow, I, I never thought that you would grow up to be this way. I was like, I was a child. Of course, you couldn't see that. So those changes come about from people who are in. We learn so much about each other, about being around each other. Most of the people you know come from your neighborhood, which is predominantly black and brown people. So you know these people from all over the all over the nation and 100 and plus 20 prisons that the BOP have because DO because DC no no longer have a prison. So you learn a lot of things about yourself. And so you just want to do something different. And it's no different from that environment as ordinary people growing up in their communities. You still have religious services you still have all the things that's afforded by rights in the penal institutions for people. And we choose which way we want to go. And a lot of us come out this way and we want to come out and, and, and given the chance to go into the communities and make a change. And provisions like Second Law, provisions like IRA, the Incarceration Reduction Amendment Act, provisions like the Juvenile Restoration Act will cause people who are in the inside living without hope, but knowing that this bill is, is, is upon them, they instantly change because now they see there's a light at the end of the tunnel right there. And people want to have the, the first opportunity to get out, they start changing. And so going in knowing that this is available, and I'm telling you, like Dele Delegate Lewis is in a very, very unique position where so he can track the measures of people who have incident reports from the institution going in at a very young age and being able to see how, knowing that they have this opportunity, where those numbers are at. And you can also compare those numbers to you know, people who are committing crimes. And as they age, that number go down and just look at the numbers. And it, it'll tell you something about one hope and it'll tell you something about age. And I'm looking forward to answering any questions here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tyrone. And I think you said it so well and, um, and I saw the comment um, that um, someone put, um, sent on to us that one way we can really bring about change of these issues is to humanize, to tell the story, to bring a human face to this issue because these are not just numbers, um, these are people. And so many of the comments we're seeing from uh, many of you who are with us today as part of this virtual conversation, each of you has been touched by this issue um, in, in many ways and no one should be expected um, to live without hope. Um, so Mike, I wanna switch over to you because prosecutors in decades past haven't been big champions of change. But yet you and a new wave of other reform-minded prosecutors who are coming into office because communities realize that we need to do something different and are demanding change, you all are reflecting a different starting point. Um, you parted company with many DAs in your state in supporting legislative reform to allow for these kinds of second chances and sentencing review. So talk to us about why this was important to you and how you see the role of prosecutors in the ability to change these paradigms. Yeah, thanks, Mariel. And thanks for inviting me to be on this great panel. Um, you know, I, you're absolutely right. Uh, on a lot of reform matters in this state, uh, I've definitely parted company with uh, my colleagues uh, across different counties. 
Um, I am proud to say, though, on this particular point, uh, the second look legislation that's currently in our legislature, which would allow resentencing, um, you know, we started it kind of not being supportive with the, the Oregon District Attorneys Association, but we've they've moved to neutral. Uh, so they're not I haven't quite gotten them all the way to supportive, uh, which is where I wanted to go. But uh, neutral is uh, that's a big step forward. So I, that's a big development for us here in Oregon. But I think the way that that was accomplished and, and the why is this so important uh, to me is, you know, as as the district attorney in Multnomah County, uh, you know, in where the city of Portland is, um, my top two priorities are safety and justice. You know, those are the things that, that I'm really striving to accomplish. Uh, and so when I looked at this concept, this resentencing concept, it, it really has both. It has both of those uh, things. Safety, uh, because we know that uh, really long sentences and mandatory sentences are not making us more safe. In fact, there's research uh, that shows just the opposite. They're making us less safe and they're using resources for that could otherwise be spent in things that we know would make us uh, more safe. So for one, you know, it kind of can help us dial back uh, some of the, the costs and the safety aspect uh, that, that we're trying to accomplish. The other is justice. And I think for too long, you know, a prosecutor's role in, in having and creating justice seemed to end at the sentencing phase, that we would work up a case, we'd take it to trial, we'd get the conviction, and then we'd say, there, we've accomplished justice. Uh, but you know what's kind of uh, spoken to me through looking at this and learning from some of my peers nationally uh, who have taken this on, like Dan Satterberg up in Seattle, who actually came in and spoke to the Oregon District Attorneys Association on, on his experiences with this, uh, was that justice doesn't stop at sentencing. It needs to continue. And a lot of the reforms uh, that I'm supporting, uh, you know, ending cash bail, ending mandatory minimums, ending the death penalty, a lot of those are prospective, but we also need to be willing to go back and look retrospectively about how, what about the people who are already there? What can we do uh, for those folks? And I think this accomplishes that. So it, this uh, legislation, which is currently under consideration in Oregon, uh, it's called Senate Bill 819, it's our resentencing legislation, accomplishes both of those things. I think it will increase public safety and it will also increase justice. And I just want to pick up on something Tyrone said, because I think he was just so uh, spot on. Uh, the creation of hope is also a public safety uh, mechanism. It also increases public safety. And, and we've heard that from prison officials who talk about when people have no hope of being released, when they're serving mandatory sentences, where in Oregon, you are going to serve every single day that you're sentenced in the courtroom by the judge who you know, doesn't have a crystal ball, doesn't know if you're gonna be uh, working on your rehabilitation, doing the right things or not. Uh, but where we're serving every day for a day sentence, we don't have hope. And so when talking to uh, Dan Satterberg up in Seattle, he said that was one of the things that he's heard from prison guards is that just this being a possibility, he's heard from them that it changes behavior internally, that people now say, hey, there's a path for me. And that's increasing public safety right away. So I think, you know, and for all the reasons that, that, I've, that me and, and others on this call have already addressed, you know, this type of legislation will allow us to look backwards and try to correct some of the harsh sentencing practices of the past, make them consistent with increasing public safety, uh, where people are aging out and we're spending resources to hold them. Uh, we don't need to be doing that for public safety. And then also uh, increasing uh, justice by being willing to look at people who are doing the hard work uh, of making themselves better and, and get them back uh, into our community. So there's a lot of great reasons to support this type of legislation. And, and I'm really looking forward to uh, our conversation. Thanks so much, Mike. And um, I appreciate your mentioning Dan Satterberg in Seattle. Um, there are also some other terrific champions for change around the country. Um, Carl Racine in DC, who supported legislative change in that jurisdiction that similarly allows for second looks. And, um, and as 
was mentioned in passing, um, Fair and Just Prosecution had the opportunity to bring over 60 of those voices, prosecutors, legislative, uh, law enforcement leaders around the nation who joined in a statement calling for change here, calling for legal vehicles that allow for second chances, the kind of legislative reforms that Delegate Lewis has through his leadership made possible in Maryland, calling for creation of sentencing review units that we see cropping up in different offices around the country to provide a second look for individuals who no longer need to be behind bars to promote um, community safety and who are better off, return to the community, better off for all of us. Um, calling for increased use of compassionate release and also significantly calling for mechanisms within their offices where high level approval should be required before a lengthy sentence is sought um, by an individual prosecutor in court. So we can change these things, correcting past injustices. We also need to put the brakes on and avoid future lengthy sentences from resulting without someone at the highest level of a DA's office saying that that lengthy sentence should be, needs to be, is appropriately advocated for. So we would encourage you to look at that letter, see if your DA is signed on, and if not, encourage them to think about bringing their voice to this important issue. So I know that there was some um, questions that came up um, in the Q&A, including one about how we convince survivors, individuals who have been victimized, by criminal behavior to join this conversation. And in fact, we know that in those legislative changes that were made in DC and the sentencing project report notes this as well, that the DC network of victim recovery supported change. We know that survivors have been champions of the need to have a different starting point and they are not all of one view too often in the past. They have been grouped together in a presumed opposition to sentencing review or criminal justice reforms more broadly. So Delegate Lewis, I'd love to have you comment on this topic. You know, what have you seen around the perspectives of survivors and how do we get them to participate in this call for reform? I think it's a great question. And um, I would like to start by saying that uh, victims and or survivors are not monolithic. Uh, they are a diverse group of people like, like any other uh, collective in our country. I actually came to the issue of the Juvenile Restoration Act because of a man named Paul LaRufa. Uh, Paul LaRufa lives in St. Mary's County, uh, Maryland, which is in our southern tip before you go to Virginia. And um, he was one of the victims of the DC sniper who rampaged our region, uh, actually across the country, we, we found out later, but especially our region uh, 20 years ago. He was shot five times by Lee Malvoy, um, who was a, a minor. And you know, when I spoke to Paula Rufa, who asked me to introduce the bill and introduce me to a lot of the research, he explained to me that when he was first uh, victimized, uh, yeah, he wanted Lee Malvoy to get the death penalty. And, you know, he did not have any compassion in his heart for him. Uh, but then once he found out that this young man had been both uh, physically traumatized, um, sexually abused, uh, and coerced by an adult to do the acts that he committed, he felt that Lee Malvoy needed to, um, of course, do some degree of time service for what he did, but he didn't deserve to die in prison. And, and that was critically important. And, you know, in every stage uh, to which we were working on our bill, we had um, victims and victims' families participating. You know, sometimes folks would try to use, um, you know, survivors as a wedge against change as if they speak for all folks and, and you don't you know and i think uh, the da said appropriately uh, what we're ultimately looking for is justice for all people you know and when someone gets incarcerated that does not mean they are no longer a citizen and as such uh they're entitled to certain rights uh and i think you know uh, a, a fair review uh, to see if they're changed and able to return to society uh is, is fair but um survivors are not monolithic So Mike, I wanna um, turn that over to you as well. So you can offer your thoughts on that issue. And maybe let me also weave into it a question that I see that's come up in the Q&A, which is um, whether as you've thought about these issues, it's also not simply changed how you think about past sentences, but also how you think moving forward about plea recommendations or sentencing recommendations 
um, that you still have the opportunity to impact and um, hopefully can avoid needing to fix after the fact. Yeah, thanks, Miriam. I, well, to start off, um, and you know, I completely appreciate and agree with Delegate Lewis's point. You know, victims aren't a monolith at all, and I meet with crime victims and survivors uh, frequently, almost probably on a daily basis. Uh, and and you know, people want different things. They want to know that they're safe. They want to know why it happened to them. They want to make sure that it never happens again. Those are the questions uh, that we get the most of, and you know, what feeds into ultimately becomes our sentencing recommendation. You know, we try to take those things into consideration. Uh, and this uh, allows us uh, to, to think in how can we address um, the needs. And I think we need to do a better job of, of helping survivors get those answers, but also recognizing that prison or not prison is not uh, always going to be helpful. And we just had uh, someone the other day who, instead of a carceral uh, outcome, instead of a prison sentence, they advocated for a restorative justice uh, option and said that that's what they wanted to see happen in their case. Uh, so, you know, in looking at this re this uh, concept of resentencing, uh, it's critically important that we incorporate uh, the voices of survivors. Um, we have had them, uh, groups that, uh, that are represent survivors, in every step of the way, I think there's a there's a very a crucial aspect of procedural fairness. We need to make sure that we're trauma informed, that we're reaching out, that people have rights to know and be informed of all these things. Uh, but it doesn't. And while we want their feedback and we want their input and we want to help address the trauma that, that they have suffered, um, you know, it is a bigger picture of looking at, at what is justice. And, and that's my job as district attorney is to kind of step back and, and look at all the pieces for, of society and, and think what is a just outcome. Uh, a survivor's voice is a crucial aspect uh, in a piece of information, uh, but also looking at you know, some of the background information about you know, the age at which the offense was, uh, you know, was committed and the context and, and the place that that person came from, it all goes into how we use this type of a concept. Um, and then Miriam, so your question on the looking forward, uh, absolutely. You know, um, I have, I was privileged to actually spend a lot of time uh, going in and speaking to people who are incarcerated in prison systems, uh, in, across the United States, but also even uh, internationally, I got to go to Norway and see their system uh, as well. And, and you know, I think that is an area where um, has really impacted the way I look prospectively. Uh, so it's not just looking back, but you know, some of the things I've talked about, mandatory sentences where you, know, you basically take away anybody's incentive to rehabilitate themselves and you take away that hope. Uh, you know, those are aspects and things that I'm advocating for change here in the state of Oregon. Uh, and we'll be looking at our practices internally and have already begun to look at our practices around plea negotiations and, and plea bargaining and things of like that to make sure that, you know, the things that we are doing line up with these philosophies of, of giving people that opportunity to prove that they, uh, you know, can be redeemed, that they might not be the same person that, that we saw in that horrible moment but in the future that, that they can rejoin our community uh, and, and, and still help um, you know, make us all safer. Thanks so much, um, Mike. And, and I'd like to maybe Kevin um, now sort of zoom out to, um, to some other states. We've, we've talked about Maryland, we've talked about Oregon and the way in which the leadership reflected on this call has benefited so greatly um, as it thinks about a new starting point from, um, from individuals such as these. Tell us about what the national landscape looks like. And, and I know there's a question that's come into the Q&A about where else do we see reform percolating? Um, give us a, a little bit of that snapshot. Yeah, it's hard to address all the states, and I encourage people to check out our website. If you go to fam.org and go to our Second Chances page, we have a tracker that is, you know, is monitoring all the bills that are moving in the states. Um, and I think, like all I, good ideas, this one's becoming contagious. And people should understand we're sort of at the outset of this. DC is a pioneer. That the the IRA that uh, Tyrone benefited from, the Second Look Law that's now being extended to people under twenty five. 
that is a fantastic law. It applies to people regardless of their offense and it, it's, it's cabin by age. We see in California where it requires the prosecutor to bring the motion. Um, we saw what Delegate Lewis did in Maryland and other states are doing something similar like in Texas where they're looking at age requirements. So it's people under a certain age can benefit uh, regardless of the offense they committed. <laughs> Illinois is looking at you know, a second look to, for 20 years, regardless of the offense you committed. Minnesota, a bunch of states are, are starting to take this up. And if you're in a state right now and you don't know if your state's doing it, you know, reach out because the models are starting to exist. And when good ideas get out there, lawmakers from other states want to copy those ideas and, and try them. And I just want to say something that um, our friend D.A. Mike Schmidt mentioned, which is for some people, this is hard because the offenses we're talking about are serious. Let's just be clear about that. These are serious offenses. And so for some, there's just this retribution uh, impulse that kicks in and it's hard. But this is a reform, I think, going forward to the next five years that has the ability to be the most progressive and the most conservative support. Progressive in the sense that you're getting at these serious offenses, the real drivers of mass incarceration, and where, the, where, where racial bias exists at its greatest point. Look at our life or population. For conservatives, if you were looking at reforms solely through a lens of public safety, and you wanted to incrementally reduce incarceration, this is the next population you would let out. These are people who are the least likely to recidivate. So I know you have to get over the hurdle of the offense they committed and that impulse to punish, but this is a smart population to let out. So I think you're gonna see momentum grow in red and blue states. And we're starting to see that right now. And I, like I said, come to our website to see all the states are multiplying. It's also mentioned in the Sentencing Project's new report, as you mentioned. Thanks so much, Kevin. And um, and I want to also shout out, I know that we have a number of um, elected prosecutors from around the country who are with us um, on this, uh, this virtual conversation. Um, I see them in our list of attendees, um, wonderful elected prosecutors like Brian Middleton, uh, Deborah Gonzalez, Jared Williams, um, Matt Ellis, they are among, um, and Sarah George in Vermont, they are among um, individuals along with Mike who are demanding that we do things differently, are looking to change these paradigms um, and are very much standing up the need to no longer keep fueling mass incarceration. I also want to acknowledge because I saw a question um, in the Q&A about how do family members engage and um, so many family with loved ones behind bars, especially this past year, um, have been going through that um, uh, incredibly um, traumatic scenario of, uh, of, of not being able to be in contact with their loved one while also deeply worried. Um, and even before this past year, um, so many who have been unable to get a hug um, on a birthday or to have their loved one with them, despite the fact that their loved one really could safely be back in their community and with their family, having already served, you know, lengthy periods of time. So I would encourage folks to look at the tremendous work of Ebony Underwood and We Got Us Now, um, as well as other groups that are trying to bring that voice to the conversation. Um, Tyrone, before I open it up for other um, Q&A that, that we're seeing, um, I want to spend a minute talking about sort of what happens um, after uh, we return individuals to the community? Um, how do we ensure that it's not just about getting um, those who can safely come home, getting them home, but also ensuring that their pathway is going to be as successful as possible? And you have done some terrific work in thinking about that all important question about reentry. So what steps can policymakers, advocates, and others take to ensure that returning members of the community are set up for success? Well, Myrna, thank you for that very, very important question. And one is the allocation resources for reentry to the reentry providers. Like one, because like you can't have people returning to the community in small but large numbers because we, we also have to look at the capacity of the reentry providers that's in these communities. And so they are being overfluxed with numbers of people being released from different measures. So, you know, we got to have 
the right amount of resources so they can serve all the people who come through their doors. And DC, we had something very special. We had a sit down uh, when uh, quite a few of us who first come home under uh, the Incarceration Reduction Amendment Act, uh, we sat down with uh, Council Member uh, Allen and his staff. You know, and it was like a welcome home type of party for us. And he asked us, like, what do we need? And we was like, oh, we want to have good jobs. We want to, you know, we don't need housing. We need this. We have a problem with IDs. And he, he, he listened to us. And so from that day, I, I wrote a, a concept paper based off reentry support for former juvenile lifers who was returning home which entails a case management model of people who provide workforce training, job skill training, resume writing, and social services. You know, after people served a long, a long prison term, like they just need somebody to talk to and like convincing people, especially men of color, that it's all right to just talk to someone and it's not about medication because we all suffer trauma from going away for for such a long time at a very young age so those services will are, are, are very popular and like we, we we're still asking for more you know not only that we're now asking our city councilmen to like create avenues to get them a career to keep people in in the society keep them working and as surprising as our former president trump said that this is untapped potential that was a true statement, you know, it's untapped potential. Like, you know, these people can be put to work and they can be paying taxes and, and making and making us all safe, as Michael said. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tyrone. And, and you're, you're so on the mark and right about that. And I think, um, as you pointed out, reentry really needs to start on day one. It, it is too late if it, is starting, you know, on the eve of release or when somebody's already back in the community. And we also need to think long and hard about conditions of confinement. Um, and as Mike and others who work with FJP know, you know, we are encouraging prosecutors and judges to never put people into facilities until they have been behind those prison walls themselves and see, seeing firsthand what those conditions are like. Because if we are removing people who need to be removed from the community, um, albeit probably for much shorter periods of time than this nation has believed in past decades. If we're removing people and putting them in places that are so dehumanizing and, um, and so demoralizing and so inhumane, we should never expect that when they return to our community that they are going to have smooth sailing. So we need to own those conditions within our prisons and jails, and we need to be smarter about what we are doing to prepare people who inevitably are coming back to our communities for a better trajectory rather than set them up for repeated you know, stumbles and failures along the way. Um, so, um, so let me maybe um, throw this open um, uh, perhaps Kevin and Mike, for both of you, I know, Mike, you touched a little bit on this. And Kevin, you've got sort of that national perspective, having seen some of the laws around the country. Um, I guess let me ask you a twofold question. Um, first, we know that some laws have come about. I think they're better. But what does best look like? You know, why should prosecutors alone hold the key to reopening this door? You know, what would a model they'll look like, and, and actually there's a link that um, Emily Blumenthal on our team, who's been so wonderful in putting these links into the chat, can put out there uh, for those who want to see what a model legislative um, enactment might look like. But what does best look like? And, and second of all, what are some of the factors that either prosecutors or legislators, as they're crafting bills, should be putting into the mix that um, can and should be considered when we're trying to make that call about whether re to return people to the community. Mike, do you want me to go first? Or? Go ahead. Um, 
I don't think there's a perfect bill out there yet. I like the DC bill because, you know, there's no exceptions. Now it applies to people under 24. A lot of people who make these mistakes are younger people. So you're going to, you're really going to be able to address a lot of the serious crimes and these serious sentences if you start there. So I like that approach better than what I fear happens in a lot of reform efforts, which is people get excluded. Um, we have people that, you know, everybody has a bias that crime they hate. Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to give a second chance to everybody except people who commit first degree murder or who commit sex offenses or do X or Y. And we start excluding the population that we really need to try to give a second look to. And of course, remember, this is not letting everybody out. It's just stopping throwing everybody away. You're just trying to make sure that people have a chance to have their sentence revisited. So I like DC. There are some bills out there, um, you know, that, that in, like in Illinois, it's a 20 year, it would apply to everybody. The one thing I would say about the prosecutor trigger is, and I'm grateful to all of the reform-minded prosecutors across the country who are using this. Um, but you know, for a lot of families out there, their prosecutor was the one is still in place. They sent their loved one away. They're not going to get a second look from that prosecutor. And so I think it is a good interim measure. I think in states that don't allow for it, it's a good first step to take. But I think we need to get to a system, as I said earlier, where there are lots of mechanisms in place to revisit long sentences. So it's not dependent on the judge who sent you away or the prosecutor who sent you away or the governor who's reluctant to use clemency. I think we need all of those at play to revisit these sentences. So I like the prosecutor ones. I'm grateful the prosecutors in California who are using their second look law. Um, and, in, in, and a lot of the folks that are working with you, Miriam, who are revisiting long sentences. But I think we need more than that. Yeah, and I'll just uh, pick up from that a little bit um, in something that, that Kevin actually said earlier about the bipartisan nature of this. Um, so, you know, one of the things that that I faced was how to get the district attorneys of Oregon at least to not be in opposition to this legislation, if possible. And so we had D.A. Satterberg from Seattle come in and talk to them, and that really meant a lot that he answered a lot of questions. And then we also had Jeff Reisig, uh, D.A. in Yolo County, which I think he has a different kind of perspective, a more conservative perspective. But both uh, both gentlemen came in on Zoom <laughs> to present to our district attorneys association, and uh, we had great conversation. I think one of the things that stuck out, and so if you're wondering, you know, how do we bring this to to our jurisdiction at home, and how do I have this conversation with my DA? You know, one of the things I think really resonated for the district attorneys who in Oregon who may have been initially. Um, you know, thinking in, they were oppositional was every prosecutor has that case that sticks out in their mind where even though they don't think they're, they did anything wrong, not ethically, but they just wonder themselves, you know, was 20 years, was that too much? Uh, maybe that wasn't necessary in that case. And, you know, almost without exception, uh, when you start thinking and asking prosecutors to think back on their careers and cases, they can all think about cases that kind of just stick back there and bother them a little bit. Well, this enables them to do something about that. And I think that was very powerful. Uh, and so when you start to think about, you know, how do we really do justice? I think that we can reach DAs of, of all stripes uh, on this issue to take a second look at a lot of these sentences and, and be open and willing to, to knowing that we did our best at the time when we were in the courtroom, but we don't have crystal balls and people change and communities change and our values and norms change. And let's make sure and look back at what we did 20 years ago and see if they still line up and are necessary for public safety and are um, congruent with what justice means. Thanks so much, um, Mike. And um, Tyrone, before I wrap us up, I, I want to turn it back to you because you have seen these issues, you know, up close. You have, you know, you have seen the faces of individuals who no longer need to be returned, need to be removed from the community and can safely return um, and are being um, kept there at the cost of billions of dollars that could be better invested in so many other productive things that could help our community at large. So let, let me offer it up to you for any final thoughts and, and then I'll close this down. Thank you, Maria. I'm, I, I have seen that. I have a very, very close friend of mine and we used to always talk. And I used to always tell him like, I feel bad that I qualify for 
a new piece of legislation because I was 17 years old and you were 18 years old in 33 days. What what's the difference? It's like like there was there's no difference. You I was 17 and you were 18, right? So it's nothing magical that happened at 18. And also just see that so everybody here can understand like we're not advocating that people not be held accountable for their actions, right? But we do want some appropriate measures with the actions that they are being held accountable for. And that means a lot. You know, I, I mean, to have all that time, not just me, but numbers of people that I know had that much time, like they can, they can safely be released back into the community. And so these mechanisms like Second Look provide this individualized mechanism for them. It's not a get out of jail free card. But it's just a it's just a viable chance that you can safely be released if you meet the criteria, and that's very important. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tyrone. So um, let me maybe, in some ways, um, end where we started, which is to again underscore the fact that it doesn't have to be this way. Our country is an outlier in the world. Other countries don't do this. There are different metrics for how long is long enough in other parts of the world. And those parts of the world are no less safe. In fact, in many instances, they are far more safe and more wisely invest in communities than in correctional systems. We have the power to change this. There is so much loss that has happened this past year that we haven't been able to impact. There are so many things that have been out of our control, but this, this is in our control. Prosecutors can change what they advocate for and can implement sentencing review practices. Policymakers can change laws and provide a second look. Governors can change clemency procedures and take a second look at individuals who are behind bars. All of us can advocate for a different starting point, a different way to think about drug policy that doesn't criminalize or throw away for mandated terms on end, individuals who perhaps simply need treatment or support. So we can do something about this. And I urge all of you to think about these issues, to educate others, and to continue the dialogue in your own circles, in your own communities. Again, I want to thank um, Team FJP, who um, have been providing tremendous support, Alyssa Kress, Emily Blumenthal, so many others on our team. And I want to give huge thanks to both our eloquent panelists and Kevin, to you and Daniel and your team at FAM, um, who are so wonderful in all that you do every day to move these issues forward. So thank you all. We hope you have a good rest of the day. And thank you for being part of the conversation.